Father, uh, I'm just coming before you right now, and you have you gave Daniel this vision, and we're going to look at it today. And I think even though it was given to Daniel um, thousands of years ago, we can apply what we can apply what that verse is about to, or what that chat passage could be about to us, Father, and uh, and and how we ought to just think and focus on on you and how we're supposed to be. So I just pray that as we delve into this passage, Father, that uh, you will speak through me and uh, what you, that the message that you have for everybody is clear. I pray this in your name. Amen. So I asked about, I said the three things because we are going to talk a little bit about politics today. And um, I, I know that that could be kind of like a uh, this is a touchy issue. That's why they say don't talk about it. Like, if you want to ruin a, a Thanksgiving dinner, like bring a politics at the, at, you know, in November and just see, like, especially this November, it's going to be a lot of fun if you wanted to ruin your Thanksgiving dinner. Just talk about it. Um, because it's very divisive. Everybody has difference of opinions, and everybody, uh, we kind of come to our, these decisions, and I think the politics has become very divisive because what we're really... We, we make these choices, and that's, I think we get those choices based on like a, it's a stem of who we are. We, if we think this thing, we vote this way, therefore that polit- political issue becomes us. It's, it's us in a way. Does that, am I kind of reaching there? Does that make sense? I think so. Um, and I think that's why today, uh, these lights are extru- like I'm bright as, are they always as bright? I feel blind. Um, Today, politics are just so much more in your face than it was when I was 20 years old. When I, you know, when you got, I'm, when I was 21, 20, 22, yes, politics were important to me as I was like, you know, at that age, uh, I was able to, my first time I could vote for a president was in 2001. And by then I was like, I was pretty interested in all that stuff and really big on that. And, um, uh, particularly then, like, I almost, anyways, uh, today, it's sort of like, you can't even go to, like, Chick-fil-A, and that's, doesn't, that, that's now a political statement if you go there. I mean, right? Uh, this might, uh, 10 years ago, maybe some of you guys were only, like, a teenager when this was going on, but seriously, like, 10 years ago, you know, somebody found out that the that Chick-fil-A had a, as a, had a Christian president. It's, by the way, they were founded by a Christian guy. And so they found out that he was div- like giving money to groups that were promoting like marriage between a man and a woman. And so there became this huge national stink of like, we need to boycott Chick-fil-A because look at what this guy thinks and believes. And he is, he is not against the LGBTQ community. And so they tried to get this huge you know, big boycott going on. And it turns out that, thank, thankfully, in that situation, people just love Chick-fil-A sauce too much for it to, like, for us to, like, say goodbye to Chick-fil-A. And Chick-fil-A survived, and we can still get Chick-fil-A sauce today. We can even get it at Winco, thank God. Um, and so, but I mean, like, <laughs> that, that is like, even getting chicken has been politicized. And um, it's, it's, it's the nature of the of world today. So I wanted to go back a little bit to when I was younger than you are. I mean, I, when I was, I became a Christian at the age of 12, going, in, going on like a couple months from 13. So I became a Christian in seventh grade. And um, when I was, a, when, as a Christian, I, uh, you know, I'm not gonna lie and say I cared about political stuff when I was 14. But uh, when I like a few years into my like teenage thing, that's when that stuff started becoming more like relevant, uh, particularly because we had President Clinton at that time. And um, this might've been before you guys, who was born <laughs> after 2001? Okay, so a lot, some of you guys. So when Clinton was in office, he had an affair with one of his press secretaries, or one of his secretaries, Monica Lewinsky. I mean, that may, may, may mean not, it might not mean anything to some of you guys, but our president had an affair at the White House in the Oval Office with this, like, young intern woman, 
And I, at the time, I had been a Christian for a few years and was, I, I, I hear this and I, I like, I know, okay, well, cheating on your wife, that's like a really bad sin. Like you don't cheat on your wife. And oh man, he's a president. And that's, that's just not an honorable, like, oh man, like he, he did this thing in the White House. And at the end, at the time, he was, he was either like, oh my gosh, our president is a rock star, or oh my gosh, our president is like just this worldly heathen. And again, I had just become a Christian for a few years, and so I was like, oh man, our president like is a, is a heathen, like is a worldly, worldly heathen. He doesn't, even though he'll say things like, God bless America, or actually that was more of a Bush impersonation, but he, he would say stuff like that. He was not like, he did not have a faith that I had. And um, that was like, that was starting my, to form what I was going to start thinking about, like politics. Um, I was, luckily, as a, as a young Christian, I was taught, hey, the Bible is God's word for humanity. The Bible is like God, it's his love letter. It's him telling us, you know, how he loves us and what he's done for us. But it's also telling us, like, hey, this is how we as humans, this is why we need a savior. It tells us like, hey, we are fallen people and keep on choosing, you know, things that go against God's will. We keep on choosing sin. And so I, at a young age, was taught the Bible is like the, the definitive answer for how we ought to live. And, and if I had an opinion that ran contrary to what the Bible said, thankfully I was taught well, then I need to die to myself. I need to submit my, my thoughts and my opinions. And even though I feel something, if the Bible said, this is the truth, this is the way it's supposed to be, even when I was like young, I was like, okay, I need to submit to that biblical authority. So here I am, a teenage guy, and my hormones are raging, and I love girls, and I think they're amazing. And our president just you know, man, he's even getting it in the White House. There could be this idea of like, wow, what a rock star. I can totally get that. But because, like, no, uh, the Bible teaches that marriage is between, and a, like, sex would be between a, a married man and a, and a woman. Like, they, they need to have a, a, a marriage relationship for that to be acceptable. Otherwise, it's just sexual, adul- uh, that was actually adultery. But then it's just like sexual idolatry. It's sexual, like, it's sexual sin. And so, I, I, even though the, 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 the human part of me, the human male part of me, who was a teenager is thinking like, oh man, how sex would be awesome. It's, it's recognizing, no, that, it, that was wrong. That was sin. He did something wrong. Um, and an, like another example of just bending my, you know, bending my will to God's will here is, or, or submitting to what God said through his Bible you know, in, in school, you start being taught in science, you start being taught like, cre- you know, creation, but you're not being taught creation, you're being taught evolution, how the world happened. And I was being taught, you know, we were all taught, oh, there was this big bang. There was nothing, and then there was this big bang. And then over the course of a millennia, then matter kind of, enough time matter kind of forms together. And boom, with enough time, maybe there'll be some primordial soup and a life will spring from that. With enough time, you know, eventually we can get to the spot where we go from like single-celled something to humanity. And that's what we're being taught was truth. And, but because the Bible says, no, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke it into existence. He formed man in his own image. It's this like, well, everybody is being taught this this thing, but the and you're you're almost an idiot if you don't believe that the Bible says this is what cre- this is how creation formed. This is what it is. the The point is God made it. I'm going to not. I'm going to submit myself to the authority of the Bible and say, okay, I don't know exactly how it all worked, but I do know that God created things. We are not happenstance. So all that to say, when when politics became big, I started to think, how do I, as a Christian, how do I have these, you know, have these thoughts or or vote these things? How do I figure out who I'm going to vote for and still align myself with like what the Bible says? I was kind of I told Nate I was a little nervous about talking this because I think some people think. 
they're gonna hear something like, you know, if you don't vote a certain way, you're not following God's will. And that's not true. God is not a Republican. God is not a Democrat. He, the, it's, I would say, like, the, he is not of this system. He's not in this system. But Well, I don't want to say that. But he is not of the system. He's not a slave to it. So God, so if, just because you vote Republican doesn't make you a good Christian. Or if you vote Democrat, that doesn't mean you're a loving Christian or whatever. But um, at that time, I was like, I want to vote closer to how God would have me vote. And there was a party that was like, at that time, more in line with like, okay, well, they're against, they're pro-life and they're, you know, they think of, mar- of marriages between a, fam- a man and a woman. These are things that in the Bible, that, that's what it says. It defines certain things as that way. You know, the Bible says that we are made in the womb by God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, I don't believe that that should be aborted. Like that's, I'm going to, you know, align myself with what scripture says and say, okay, I believe in pro-life, not pro-choice. So I voted accordingly to that. Um, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's because the Bible tells, like talks about marriage that way. And, we, you know, we are formed man and woman. And so I voted that way to align myself that way. Uh, to like, to, to line closer to what the biblical standard is. Now, as I've gotten, lived my life and gotten through that, it's really, it's, you, you come to learn that, okay, both parties suck. Our American, our American government, all the parties suck. They're filled with, they're, they're, they're filled with sinful people. And it's, it's, that's just the, the crux of the situation. Our government is filled with sinful people who may or may not have a relationship with God or even if they, or they say, they might say they have a relationship with God or not, whatever, but as I, as I lived my life voting this way, voting a certain way and, and continuing on and running through Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, whatever, I've come to be let down a lot by just government and the choices. And even when like the guy that I wanted to win, he got into the office, man, America still sucks. This is like, this is government. Everything just, like the way you guys are running things is terrible. When Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger became president, or, I'm sorry, uh, governor, oh cool, we have a Republican governor of California. This is gonna be cool. No, that, to- it, that totally still sucked. Everything sucked. And um, again, because they're fallible humans. They're humans with sin nature. And I kind of, you know, through my 20s and 30s, started to become more disillusioned with, like, government of, like, oh, maybe, maybe my hope should not be placed in, in government. Maybe my hope should not be placed in if one party member is going to be voted into office versus another office. And... Um, it became this kind of growth where now today I, I, I do vote a particular way because, again, I'm going to vote and I'm going to try to align myself with the way that God, like with God's word. Again, God is not Republican or Democrat or whatever, but God has a standard in his Bible. And, I'm going, and when I can vote for policies, I'm going to try to vote for policies that lean that way. We live in America where we get that right, that pri- honestly, it's a privilege. We have, we've gotten this, you know, through bloodshed. We have this ability to, to vote, yes or no, on things of, of topics of that nature. I want to submit to the Bible and vote accordingly. I, t- I told Nathan I was a little nervous of talking about all this because, again, that's, that could, this is such, so divisive. And you could hear what I'm saying and, and still walk away and say, well, Joey said, you know, if you don't vote pro-choice or pro-life, then you're whatever. I mean, I, I, I just wanted to say I voted based on trying to get closer to God. And I, I cared about who was, I, I listened to like talk radio. I listened, I read blogs. I, you know, I did my research on people and I voted. And sometimes the guy that I wanted won. And sometimes the guy that I wanted, I didn't want won. My point is, it all still sucks. Like, it does not, it doesn't matter. And I think today, now that I'm 44, um, I would say, honestly, the last election was, I had been building up in my head, this is so important, this is so important. And then it didn't go the way that I wanted it to go. And it was like, why was that so important to you? Why did, why did you have so much hope? Why did you place so much hope or faith in somebody or in something or some party? Um, I look at that now and I think, okay, I'm still going to, it's important to vote in November, but whoever wins or doesn't, it's not going to, I, I, I'm going to just, I told 
the guys at our meeting earlier, like, it says about like letting go and letting God. I'm not going to sit here and let this affect me. I'm going to let go and just trust in God. Let's read about in Daniel 7. Now, Daniel, we've been talking about, the first six books of, of Daniel have been kind of the story of Daniel. He is, he's, a, he's a person who was his, you know, when uh, Assyria comes in and, and conquers uh, the, the kingdoms of Israel and uh, Judah, uh, Daniel becomes this like, he's a refugee. But he was, he was trained to work, to serve for the king, um, you, know, uh, you know, as a kind of a slave. But he, but God used him and worked through him to, give, to make him a person of power. Like basically kind of like a, you know, by at one point, he was the third most powerful person in uh, the government, in, in the kingdom, because he was just submitting to God. And, you know, we hear some stories about like, you know, some of the other, I'll, to use words today, some of the other politicians were really annoyed at Daniel. So they got the president to like do an act like, okay, only you're going to be worshiped. And if anybody worships anybody but you, they need to be thrown in the lion's den. And, and Daniel was he was like, I'm, I can't worship anybody but God. And he remained faithful. And we hear the story about how he was thrown in the lions and uh, the lions didn't eat him. And actually the, the king, or you know, to use our terms today, like the president was like, okay, your God, he, he was moved and, and he had faith in God because he was like, your God is going to protect you in this because of your faith. And so that's one story we got. So the first six, you know, we also got the one about like, um, Meshach and Abednego, Daniel's friends, who were also kind of in the same boat as he was, they were thrown in the fire because they weren't going to bow down and worship the false idol. They only were only going to worship God. And so we get these stories of how these guys, primarily Daniel, we focus more on him, about how that he was basically like a refugee and he was faithful and he, saw, and he trusted in God and God protected him. Now we're entering into the next few chapters. We're going at like, specific visions that Daniel had. And this one, seven, chronologically, it takes place like before like uh, chapter six in the Bible. We're going back to after uh, Nebuchadnezzar was king, but uh, the first year of King Belshazzar's reign, that's another one of the kings because Daniel served under a couple kings. Um, just like today, we have like people working under a couple cabinets at presidencies. So we're... We're looking at seven, and here's one of vision that happened in the first year of King Belshazzar. Uh, in the first year of King Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. So he had a weird dream, and he wrote it down in a dream journal. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the man's heart was given to it. And suddenly, another beast, a second, like a bear, and it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in his mouth between his teeth. And they, said thus, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour more flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like another beast, like a leopard, which had on his back four wings of a bird. The beast had also four heads, and a dominion was given to it. So these are first, like, he's sitting here looking at this ocean, and it's like, He's seeing this, these waters, they're tumultuous. And then out of a boom, pops out this, this beast that's, uh, that's this lion with wings on it. But then even then, as he's watching this lion with wings, the wings are put up and the lion is made to stand up like a man and start, and start acting like a man. Even saying that it had like a, a man's heart was given to it. And then he sees this beast of this bear and this weird bear who is, for some reason, it's, lifted, it's raised on one of its sides and it has these ribs in his mouth. And, you know, these, this multitude of people surrounding watching all these beasts are telling it like, yes, eat more flesh, keep going, uh, just keep eating. So it's this weird hungry bear with like, you know, like with ribs in his teeth because he's just devouring flesh. After, and then this, this third was this leopard, which, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a cat that's, you know, not, not strong like a lion, he's not the king of the jungle, you know, he's not Simba, but he's like this 
you know, he's as another strong animal that has four wings on its back, like a bird. And it was given this great, just great authority overall. And then after this, um, in verse seven, he says, after this, I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. As I, and as I was considering the horns, there was another horn, a little one coming up among them before, before whom three of the horns were plucked out of the roots and there and there, in this horn, were eyes like eyes of a man in a mouth, speaking pompous words. So this fourth monstrous beast, he doesn't even say it's like a lion or a bear or a dragon. It's something, this weird beast with weird, with the iron teeth and these horns. And the horns, you know, first there's like 10 of them, and then some of them are plucked out. And then there's this one horn in particular that has a mouth and eyes like a man, and it's saying these, all these like pompous words of how great it is. It's blasphemous. It's like a prideful little horn. And so I watched, he continue on, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. This is where the vision takes a weird turn and he sees the ancient of days, which is another word for God. His garment was white as snow and his hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flame its wheels a burning fire. A, f- a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, like he's spitting like fire. And, and a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched them because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till that beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, that's a term that like we use for Jesus in the Bible, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one, shall not be destroyed. And so that's the first part of this Daniel 7. We're getting this vision of this dream of these beasts, and then we see God and Jesus coming in. So God takes care of the beast, this last kingdom, uh, just slaying it and throwing, it, uh, the, throwing its body into the fire. But then we see that Jesus comes in and sets up, uh, you know, we call it the, uh, the Son of Man. Uh, or I mean, th- this they use the word, uh, yeah, the Son of Man, which is another name for Jesus. Uh, he comes in and he is given a kingdom that lasts forever and it's eternal. So I just want to, that's the dream. I want to kind of sum up what he says in the, in the, in the last, in the interest of time. The, the last part of the chapter is the vision interpreted. And what he is told, um, that the, what the vision means, is that the, the four beasts are kingdoms that are coming up. And each one has their different attributes. And then uh, eventually the, a great kingdom come that is this, this terrible and, and takes over the, the main of the, uh, dominion of all the rest of them. And uh, eventually that one is destroyed. And then we see this, you know, this, you know, we get to see God and the son of man setting up their kingdom on earth. The vision really is talking about each one of these uh, beasts represents a kingdom. In Daniel chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar had that dream of that statue and, you know, his head was gold and um, his arms were different, you know, was like uh, uh, silver and anyways, it goes down to bronze and then de- eventually down to like iron and clay. So we see this, we, uh, we got this picture, this vision of the statue that was given, this dream was given to the King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel was asked to interpret it and he was told like each part of that statue represents a kingdom and, of, and the rock in the dream that the king Nebuchadnezzar has a part of the mountain like lifts up and then dis- destroys it, scattering it. And so that rock represented God and his kingdom. So we kind of have this like parallel thing of 
you know, not only did King Nebuchadnezzar got this dream of these kingdoms that were coming, um, we, Daniel, a couple years later, also had another dream that was just, again, showing these, like, kingdoms and how they kind of succeeded each other. And eventually, uh, they get, the kingdoms become this big beast. I mean, eventually, the kingdoms become this, like, this monster, you know, that's full of pride and full of death and destruction. I mean, uh, and, then, and then eventually, God comes and takes care of the king, like, takes, takes over those and then and kills the, the great kingdom. And then, Takes, it sets up his domain. The last thing I wanted to point, I did want to read, was um, uh, verse 28. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. So he kind of finishes it off after talking this dream, sharing this dream. He shares that he was like unsettled by it. He he, it was something that he kept inside of him, and he was a little, he was like a little disturbed by what he had seen. You know, it's so much so that he says it greatly troubled me. My countenance changed because of that vision that he got. And I, it kind of made me think about like, okay, we are here in a time in America where, again, I've kind of learned that whoever becomes president, we are not going to be like, saved by the next guy in office. We're not going to be, things aren't going to be like, we're not going to become this amazing like country. And I think it's very easy or tempting to kind of get into a state about like, oh man, we are so, we're so host. We're, we're, our country is doomed. Uh, we're, we're in a car going off the cliff and depending on which party is behind the wheel, are they pushing the gas full throttle or half throttle? We're just going on. We kind of get this like, I don't know, maybe you guys aren't experiencing this yet, but I mean, I'm surrounded by people who are like, oh man, we are doomed. And I think it would be very easy to be like, to be troubled about where we're going. Look at what's going on if you read the news. It, it would be very easy to be troubled by it when you're saying like, all the stuff that's going down. Um, you know, when, when one guy going for office, there's an assassination attempt on him. You know, if not for, really by the grace of God, he would have been hit by a bullet. That's very troubling. And I think it's something that, yeah, would, you know, be very like, I think if, it's very something that would very easily trouble us. But I think we have to remember the last part of Daniel's vision and I think we can apply that to ourselves today. Daniel sees that at the end of it all, the end of it is that God's gonna come back and restore his rightful rule and he's gonna set up a kingdom that's everlasting. And I think for us, um, we need to remember that any man-made government is not going to be, is not gonna create paradise. Any man-made government isn't going to be, the, you know, uh, this you know, this, we're not going to have heaven on earth because we have sinful man leading us. But I think what we do need to hope for, or we do need to remember, is that we are not citizens of this world. We are, uh, we are people who are become citizens of heaven when we accept Jesus into our hearts. And if we place our faith into him, we just have to know we're on the side. We're going to be one of those people, like, in the multitude of seas with God watching as like Jesus sets up his kingdom of earth and, you know, the, the sinful nation that was, you know, that was, that brought death and destruction, it's all going to, you know, it's going to be thrown into the fire. It's all going to be burned away. And so we can have this like um, hope that, yes, today could be hard because of what we have as a, 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 for leaders, what we have going on, the price of gasoline or the price of milk or the, or whatever, could rise as much, and we could have a tough go out of it. But I think if we are persevering in our faith, we just like Daniel, we have the hope that God's going to win. God wins this battle, and we are to persevere. I like what it says in. Um, oh, I think this is. I didn't write that. But I think it's First Peter. He says. Join together in the following, my example, brothers and sisters, just as I have 
uh, just as, a, as just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross um, of Christ. Their destination is their destiny is destruction for God is their, for their God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. So he's kind of giving this like words to his fellow believers like, look, um, though there are people who are going to live anti-Christ. They're going to live anti-Christian. And they're going to make their stomachs their, their, their God. They're going to just, they're going to make their own sinful flesh their God. Their mind is set on earthly th- things. But he goes on to say, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we, we may be like his glorious body. So there's, that's again like this hope, this hopeful message of, yeah, think the, 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 the things around you could just really be hard and miserable and, and gross. And we can see things that are just so anti-Christian, anti-Christ, anti-God. But you know what? We are not citizens of this, of what we're in. We're in this world. We're not of this world. We could live here and we could say our, I don't, this is my, my home. My home is eventually in heaven with Christ if I stay true to following him. So in a way, we can like take, we, in a very real way, we can take peace of like, yes, this sucks. But, uh, you know, uh, my job now is not to sit here and wallow in it, but to maybe reach others and say, hey, like, let's turn to God because eventually he is going to come and set up his kingdom. And guys, we need to turn towards him. So our job becomes this mission of, of preaching the gospel, sharing Christ with others so that they can have a hope. Because as much as I think the world sucks, dude, people who don't go to church, people who are whatever, they also think everything sucks. We went and watched a movie, uh, the, the new Matt Walsh movie, and um, it's called uh, Am I Racist? We watched it on Friday. And um, in that, just the amount of like, all these people are talking about, this nation sucks. We need to burn it to the ground. Everything sucks. Every, like, I think everybody's recognizing that something is wrong. We have the answer. We know that the answer is Jesus Christ. We know that the answer is following the Lord God. And if we continue in that, we know that he is going to win. We need to share that with others. We need to use our, the, uh, uh, the, the people that are around with, use whatever influence we have to be someone who is loving and sharing, the, uh, sharing their faith. Something that they said in the, the movie, Am I Racist? They said, we need to stop being nice about this. And this was this anti-racist movement saying, we need to stop being nice about it, meaning we need to get into the face of people and let them know you're secretly racist. Um, The movie is this interesting movie, by the way. Um, But we heard several people in the movie, this is viewpoints of people who wanted to disrupt the system, saying we need to stop being nice and get into the faces of others. And to me, that was like, no, I think we as Christians need to continue being nice. We need to be the anti that of, you know, okay, let's continue to be nice. I do think we need to be like diligent and share the gospel and, and stay that. But we, I don't think we need to be, we need to be still patient. We need to be kind. We need to be peaceful. We need, we need to show the fruits of, this, of what love is. Um, there was another line in the movie that was talking about how, you know, love sometimes isn't patient. And it was like, whoa, that is, that is a scriptural. Like what they're, what they're trying to teach others is don't be patient with others that you disagree with. Don't be patient. Uh, like be, get in, you know, be, don't be nice. And I think that's something that we in these times, not residents of this world, but really just, you know, uh, the Bible calls us sojourners, people who are here, a sojourner is someone who's in a plant, but they're not there. Like, that's not their residency. We are, we are called sojourners here on earth. We're not of this earth. Let us try being patient with people. Let us try being kind. Let us, try, let us just speak the gospel. 
What I do like, what I kind of wanted to finish was with this last, I said this last verse where Daniel was greatly troubled. I don't think it's wrong. I think that was, I think that's to me encouraging to read because I've had times where I'm like so stressed or so just like uncomfortable with how things are going. And I don't, and sometimes you hear this like, oh man, you just need more faith. You just need more faith to do that. And I think for me, that was very comforting to see like Daniel at this point who has gone through miraculous things with God, he was still like, oh, that was unsettling. I don't, his conscience was worried by this. And I think that's something that we are allowed to have. I think we're allowed to be troubled by the times that we're in. So let me, let me pray. My, the, I told Nate earlier, the whole point that I wanted to share tonight was that we see in Daniel, kingdom after kingdom after kingdom after kingdom keeps coming, and they're not good. They're not great kingdoms. They're, they fall to the next kingdom, and uh, eventually, they, and they get worse as they go, and so eventually the last kingdom is like pretty dreadful, and then God wins. So I think the hope there is for us today is that we know Kingdom after kingdom, after presidency after presidency after presidency, governor after governor after governor. We cannot have a faith in that. We need to have a faith in Jesus. And we need to have perseverance to, like, to continue to walk in our faith so that way we can look forward to when Jesus comes and sets up that kingdom. I think that's a better mindset that for me, I wish I had known when I was 25. Dude, Joey, stop, stop worrying about this. Stop listening to as many podcasts or talk radio as you are about this that doesn't that doesn't nothing but like make you mad that does nothing but make you upset and look at everybody as enemies what i would say to me like now that i'm on this side of that it's my testimony would be i've learned to let go and let it and just trust that okay God is, God's, my home isn't here. And yes, I'm supposed to continue voting because, uh, you know, that's my, I, I get that right. But my hope is not in the next president. My hope is not in who, you know, if the recall election will work or whatever. My hope is in Jesus. And I think that's a lot healthier place for me to be in. And I would just hope that if you at your age, if you find yourself listening to all this like talk radio, or if you find yourself like really, if you find yourself like that, I would just encourage you, man. You gotta turn off the radio. You gotta, you gotta, you know, limit the amount of time. I was listening to talk radio like all morning. Uh, my last job, I was able to listen to the talk radio all morning while I did it, my job. And man, I just, what a wasted time that was. Nothing has changed. Like nothing is better because I poured into that time um, and and got all in a huff about like you know what was going on in the government, what was going on in Washington. Nothing was good for me by focusing on all that. For me, it's so much better to just let go and let God. Let's pray. Father, I come for you, and I just thank you for this vision that is amazing, it's interesting, and um, that Daniel, he gets, to, you know, we, he gets to see what, we get to, what we're experiencing now, that man-made governments, a man-made institution, that humanity, we're fallen, and we're just not going to have, you know, we're not going to make heaven on earth, Father. Father, we need you. And we, if we, we need to put our faith in you because you do, you are going to one day build your heaven here on earth. You're going to bring your kingdom and you're going to rule. And Father, may we be the type of person that shares that, that truth, that joy with others. And so that way, as many people as possible can get to experience your, your kingship, your, your kingdom. And, and, and get to be a servant of, of you, Father. And uh, as, Father, if we're already on a path where we're way involved in like overthinking these politics stuff, if we're way, if it consumes us, Father, may we just lay that down and, and just trust it, lay it down at your feet and just trust in you. Um, not saying that we're gonna become dumb or blind to this stuff, but Father, that we don't, we don't put our hope in man again. Father, if may we put our hope and faith in you, and I think it'll, Father, help us. It'll bring more peace as we, you know, as everything just keeps on getting worse, or or, or our guy didn't win, or whatever. Father, uh, may we we'll have a lot more peace in our life. 
Father, may we, may we not even have an our guy. May we just have you. I pray this in your name. Amen.